Hey there, this time I'm going to talk about the science of colors, about the physics and our perception. Don't worry, it won't be too complicated, I keep it in a very simplistic way. At first we have to ask the question, what are colors? Well, uh, colors have something to do with light, to be more exact, with visible light that we can perceive with our eyes. And, well, light are photons or electromagnetic waves. and these electromagnetic waves have different wavelengths or different energies and mostly you talk about them in terms of wavelengths. It's more convenient in scientific circles, however I will talk about them in terms of energy because I think it makes more sense. We have, we have a better understanding about what energy is. Okay, so I have here a scale and I will move from the left to the right and at the left we have the lowest energy and as we move to the right the energy increases so at the very left we have the radio waves and i'm going to see how these electromagnetic waves are interacting with matter this is going to be important for us now so radio waves don't do that much with matter with normal matter they can interact with electrons in metallic materials and this is the reason why we have radio towers and stuff like that. Um, the next one will be radio waves. And you probably have a radio wave oven and you know, probably know that these radio waves heat up your food. Well, what is heat? Um, heat are, is movement, pretty much. It's kinetic energy. It's the vibrations and the rotations of the molecules. And radio waves are able to rotate molecules and this is the reason why it heats up your food <clears throat> the next one will be infrared so we're getting closer to our visible light spectrum um, we also probably know infrared as heat waves and when it hits a molecule for example uh, then it can cause vibrations and these vibrations are heat also the other way works when we have heat then infrared waves are emitted and we can see that with infrared cameras, ex for example, on our bodies. Now we get to the most interesting part, the visible light. So starting with the lowest energy, that is red, and ending at the highest energy, which is purple. And uh, visible light does not do that much uh, with normal matter, with normal molecules, other than causing a little bit heat, but it can also excite electrons to a higher energy level and what that means is for example when light hits our eyes and is projected on the back side of our eyes the retina then um, it excites the electrons within the molecules of the cells this causes a signal that can be sent to our brain and there we go we can see light and this is also the reason why pretty much all of the animals that can see colors uh, can see colors within this spectrum here, maybe also a little bit in the ultraviolet spectrum, but that's it. And the cool thing is that if there are aliens that can see light, then it will be most likely within the spectrum that we can see light in. Because the lower energy wavelengths would cause just some heat, and the higher energy wavelengths like um, X-rays and gamma rays would be way too destructive and it would cause ionization and things like that. So let's take a look at our human eyes. I have here a very simplified illustration. And what do we have here? We have the cornea, the pupil and the lens. And when we have light that goes through them, then it will be projected onto the retina. And especially the light will be focused onto the macula, where we have a very high density on cones. Whereas at the surroundings we have more rods. So what are these things, cones and rods? Let's zoom in. We have here the cones and the rods, and above them the receptors, the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells which collect the light pretty much. And we have less ganglion cells than cones and rods, so they are sum summarized. The cones are there for colors and details, and the rods, which are not that good with details and cannot see colors, are very good for dark situations. And we have three types of cones, red, green and blue. And the combination of these three makes it possible for us to see all of the colors. I will show you now a dark picture, so don't be surprised. And, and don't mean dark as in disturbing, okay? Uh, just 
low brightness. There we go. So we have here two Pac-Man ghosts, the yellow one and the green one. And what I want you to do now is look right between those two ghosts and don't look away. Keep your eyes on the cursor, okay? So I keep the cursor there. Keep looking for a few more seconds. Keep looking. Keep looking. Don't look at me. Keep looking. There. Okay, so still keep on looking at the same spot and I will turn off this picture and show you the white screen again. So don't be surprised. And if you do that, you will be able to see the red and blue ghosts. So let's see. Can you see them? You probably see the blue one right here and the red one right here, right? Well, you are correct, they were blue and red ghosts. Uh, the reason why you were able to see it, although it was just white, uh, is I mentioned before that there are less ganglion cells and so the cones are summarized. They are summarized in so-called receptive fields, which have a center and a surrounding, and they are grouped in two sets of colors. We have blue and yellow, while yellow is just blue and green, there are no yellow cones. And red and green. And what happened was that these receptive fields were overstimulated with yellow and green. And so it happened that also um, blue and red were very strongly stimulated. And therefore you were able to see blue and red where was yellow and green before. So let's see now how red, green and blue, when mixed together, can result in all the colors that we can see. So I have here the three main colors, red, green and blue, and when mixed together, we can have cyan, magenta and yellow. Depending on the ratio between these three colors, we can have pretty much any color you want. And when we have all of the three colors together, then we have white. And this is why it's called additive color mixing. So when we take these three colors, yellow, magenta and cyan, we get the subtractive color mixing, where all of these three together cause black. A good way to see how these colors are mixed together would be the color wheel that we have in various graphic programs like Photoshop, Clip Studio and so on. So we have around here the colors, all of the colors that are pretty much available in the rainbow. So, and at these three corners we have full red, we can see down here um, <clears throat> how much red, green and blue are mixed together from 0 to 255. And the other corner you have the green and there you have blue. And when you mix for example red and blue, then you get the other colors between. So when we move more and more to the white, then you can see we get to the maximum for all the three colors. And the other way when we move more and more to black until it gets to zero. So, But you can see already that we have way more colors right here. To explain you this a little bit better I switch down here and you can see we have an H, an S and a V which stands for hue, saturation and value or brightness. And the hue is for this color wheel that we have around here. You see? And the saturation is this axis here, the horizontal axis. As we move more and more to the white, we get less and less saturation. And value is just brightness, so as we go down, as it gets darker and darker, the value decreases. And we have all of the other colors in between, with different saturations and different values. So thinking in terms of hue, saturation and value can help you to understand colors. You have to be careful because our brain sometimes plays some tricks on us. If you look for example here, we have a gradient from black to a light gray. And we have these two dots here. And you probably would agree with me if I tell you that um, the dot here is brighter than this dot here. The thing is, they are not. 
they are exactly the same gray. So what happens here is that our brain wants to increase the contrast between colors so we can perceive details much better. So for example here we have a dark background so our brain makes the dot appear even brighter to increase the contrast. And the other way around here we have a very light background and so it makes the dot appear darker. So for the next thing I want to show you, uh, I picked out a photo from a trip to Japan, to the Fushimi Inari Shrine. And what you have there are hundreds or even thousands of these red gates. And what I did is I shifted the colors more to a yellow or green. And when you look at this photo, you would still believe me if I would say that these gates are red, right? It, or maybe a reddish orange at least. Well, let's look at the next photo. Now I shifted it more into the blue direction. And I think with this photo it works even better. You would still believe me that these gates are red, right? So let's look at the original. This, believe me, has no color shift. And you can clearly see that these gates are pretty red. Now let's pick out a specific spot right here and compare the colors. Well, you can clearly see that we have a very clear red right here, but the other two aren't red at all. They are more of a mm, very dark purplish color and orange color. But our brains told us that these gates still look red. It also compares the color in the surrounding area. For example here it's very blue. And so this purple appears to us red because it's closer to red, if you know what I mean. So if you pick your colors for your drawings or paintings, and be careful and see how they also would work with each other and not just how they look by themselves. Alright, now I want to do something new at the end of my videos. I wanted to do some extra Q&A videos, but instead I had the idea to include a Q&A section at the end of my tutorial videos. Just about one or two minutes, not too long. And to start with that I will answer some questions that I get very often. For example, what tablet I'm using. So this is a Wacom Cintiq Companion 2. And I chose this one because it's very convenient for me and you can draw pretty much wherever you want to. Um, I can draw in parks and cafes at friends places because it's simply just a tablet but with the Wacom technology. If you want to get one of these or a Cintiq tablet then I gotta tell you they are very expensive and I started originally with a very cheap uh, Wacom bamboo pen, uh, like about 50 bucks I think, and I recommend you if you're just starting with digital art that you at first start with a very cheap one. And when you get better and you want to do some professional work and also got some extra bucks and then it's then it would be the time to uh, switch to a Cintiq where you can draw on the screen. And here's a question for you. So some people only have two cones and some even just one. Do you know somebody like that and how is this person able to live with it? I think it's a very interesting topic. There are even people who have four different cones. Um, but they are very rare and it's very unlikely that you know somebody like that, but who knows. Alright then, if you have any questions, feedback or requests from me, then please leave a comment down below or send me a tweet. And if you want to help me keeping the show on running, then please support me on Patreon and you can also get some nice rewards there. Alright then, have fun drawing or whatever you do with colors.